And just in contract law on UN's presentation on what is a private administrative process and how you can win with credit cards, divorce and custody issues, foreclosure mortgage issues, tax issues, uh, credit reports, tickets, or other more serious uh, criminal or civil charges, uh, vacant home acquisition, and stopping corporate or governmental uh, bullies from uh, bossing you around alphabet agencies, CPS, uh, etc. Okay? Understand contract law on uwin.com. Okay, this presentation and the information contained therein is not intended as legal advice. Okay, now. <clears throat> a private administrative process is a commercial remedy in law based on a contract or a trust usually in which the party receiving a benefit and both parties could be receiving a benefit but in which one or more of the parties receiving a benefit agrees to give up their benefit agrees to give up their property or rights if they fail to perform their duties or fail to make a payment the terms of those rights are in the contract or the indenture but usually include the creditor if there's money being extended or a benefit being extended um, usually includes the creditor exercising rights upon the debtors conversion into default status so the one who owes the money to the creditor is the debtor and by going into default meaning you habitually have not paid and you know 30 60 90 days have gone by um, now you're in default status and, and, and upon a notice of default notice default status being achieved <laughs> um, enforcement is possible enforcement is usually done non judicially so in a that's that's in a private administrative process now to con contrast that with a public process what I mean by that is a public process is done through the court system that you're familiar with uh, you know with the clerk of the court and you go down to the courthouse the district court of uh, such and such county in the state of such and such or the federal district court or, or the superior court or the appellate court that is a public process where you open up a lawsuit pay a fee uh, pay for a process server to serve the other party or provide service through you know process server knocks on your door hey are you so-and-so hey you've been served here's some paperwork there's a you know here's a summons here's a lawsuit and then they sign a certificate of service or an affidavit of service you can also in certain types of cases you can also do service through the mail um, and service is done through a registered agent for that individual or for that corporation so all corporations have registered agents which are the one who the service must be done through all service of process for public lawsuits so then what happens is they have 20 to 35 days to answer the summons and complaint and provide a notice of appearance and so forth and uh, jurisdiction is presumed unless someone challenges jurisdiction but a public process means that one of the entities has found a third party arbitration or mediation or um, judicial uh, third party to judge and determine and administer the facts and the law the facts and the law <clears throat> so when you answer you might rebut certain presumptions you might say no 
you know, this is not valid, I didn't do this, this is my defense, this is my, uh, this is my position. And then you might put exhibits, affidavits, proof that you made a payment, proof that you're not under the jurisdiction, proof that you are not um, non-performing, or proof that you have performed, or proof that you never signed this contract, or proof that, you know, whatever. So whatever your defense is, you're going back to that third party court arbitration mediation think about it as a third party mediation company and if both parties agree to go through third party arbitration mediation company then that court the clerk the judge their whole procedure and their whole they're being appointed as the one to determine the facts and the law and issuing a decision and order and then both parties are going to file their uh, you know the, the the original complaint and the answer possibly an answer and a counter complaint a counter claim and they're going to go back and forth asserting their position into the court and filing motions for discovery of the facts possibly going to trial possibly having a summary judgment and having the court eventually issue an order that's a public administrative process okay so this presentation is on a private administrative process. I assume we will be doing some public process uh, webinars coming up as well. But let's do the private administrative process because it's the one that people are, you know, right now uh, very uh, concerned about learning about and learning how to do. So um, here are some examples of private administrative process. Okay, private administrative process, again, there's no court, there's no third party arbitration, there's no, no, there's no court action in the, in the, in the way that, that you're familiar with what a court is. Okay, so here's some examples that you're probably familiar with. Car repossession. Okay, when you fall behind on your monthly car payments, if you finance the car, if you didn't pay for it outright and you put money down and you're going to make payments over the next few years to pay it off um, that agreement that you signed with the bank gave them the right you granted them the right to repossess and take the car if you fell behind for you know two three four months whatever it is they did not need to go to court they did not need to file anything with any court or get a judge to sign on anything okay so that's in a car repossession traffic suspension of your driver's license is easy example is you do not respond to a ticket you do not plead guilty or not guilty you don't send it in they send you a notice months later notice of uh, suspension of license your license will be suspended as of this date not immediately suspended but they send you a, a second notice saying you have to pay it or you have to uh, cure your fault of not responding otherwise your license will be suspended they did not need a judge to sign that it's an administrative it's a private administrative process IRS and, or tax agencies uh, they if they assess a tax if there hasn't been tax paid and they assess it and they try collections and uh, they go to the next step they might send a notice of intent to levy and just levy the funds from your bank account they do not go to court they do not take you to court they don't serve you with a lawsuit they don't take you to court there's no trial there's no nothing it's a private administrative process foreclosure in a deed of trust state so there are judicial foreclosure states and non-judicial foreclosure states uh, examples of a judicial foreclosure state is New York, Florida, Illinois. Examples of a non-judicial or deed of trust state is California uh, and Tennessee. So um, in those states, in judicial states, they have to do a public process in court. In deed of trust states like California, they do not need to take you to court to sell your home. They file a notice of default at the county recorder, and then they can just sell your house from there. 
Now, all these things I've discussed in these four examples here, the rights that are being enforced, they're all based on the contract. And they're all based on uh, you receiving a benefit. Okay? So, if you don't want these privileges and uh, property taken away from you, either pay, pay for your car outright, <laughs> um, don't owe taxes or pay all your taxes or pay for your house outright okay easier said than done I know um, and don't ask permission you know I could also put on here suspension of your doctor's license you know doctor's license chiropractic acupuncture license massage license any license permission you need to have a uh, license from the state that you're a certified you know medical doctor or or, or attorney or whatever, having your license to practice law, um, all those things can be suspended or terminated through a private administrative process. Um, and so, my whole position might be, or my question to you might be, do you really need to depend on these entities? Do we need to depend on the, the banks, the financial institutions, the uh, state licensing boards in order to operate? Do you really need permission? Do you really need these things? Um, I could also throw on here the um, taking of your children from you. Child protection services can take your children from you without a lawsuit. Okay, so that's another good example I could throw on here. Um, let me write that down and add it into the slides. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this first slide here because this is the foundation. Um, you know, don't register the birth of your children with the state. Don't give the state the title to your children and then you do not allow them to come back and take their children from you in a private administrative process. Okay don't ask per, for permission for all these things and then you won't have those benefits taken away from you uh, fend for yourself and uh, build your own infrastructure where you're not dependent upon these other entities that is one uh, <clears throat> way to prevent these uh, things from being taken away from you is to just buy them yourself and learn to operate in the world a little bit differently and I know that's easier said than done and a lot of people on this uh, presentation might not know how to do that um, but uh, that's kinda like what we what we teach um, here's some other here's some other examples in here becoming a tenant um, these examples are they're they're a little bit um, in a separate category I wouldn't call them private administrative processes in the same way as the the top four bullet points are um, completely they're a little bit different but just to give you the idea and the concept which I'm trying to drill home here <clears throat> what gives you the legal right to possess a prop piece of property okay there's one document that you have an agreement and you have this document which memorializes the agreement you have a uh, lease agreement um, there's no public record anywhere that you have the right to live there it's a private agreement between between the the tenant and the landlord if someone were to go look up at the county recorder your name wouldn't be on there at all so probably the landlord is on the mortgage if he's still paying a mortgage and then he's leasing the property to you and giving you the right to live there and I ask you what gives you the right to be there and it not be trespassing a signed document but that's a private administrative process do you ha do you have did you ever go to court and get a judge to sign off on anything saying yeah you have the right to live there no you just signed a contract and he gave you the keys 
and you have the right to live there and do lots of other things there. Okay, so we're enforcing our rights all the time through private administrative processes without needing, you know, any third party court or arbitration approval or decision. So I just want to point that out that you're already exercising rights without a court order because it's not needed in a private administrative process. Okay, moving on. Uh, credit score. You signed a contract with your credit cards. If you went behind, if you missed payments, they can do a negative reporting on your credit score. So that's another private administrative process. No lawsuit needed, no court action needed. Um, any benefits, food stamps, unemployment, social security benefits that the legal entity is receiving uh, as well can be taken away from you based on the fact that it's a benefit. Um, they don't have to provide you with those things. They can take them away from you at any time that they want based on the previous contracts. They can take your children away from you at any time that they want according to their statutes and regulations. They have certain you know, reasons why they will and why they won't. Um, but ultimately they can do it anytime that they want. So if there's a complaint, someone at school mentions that your child complained that their parents hit them or was abusive to them, whether it's true or not, and they can even make it up and file a complaint and boom, you have your children taken away from you. So there you go. Um, because it's the government's children too, because you filed a birth certificate and you're giving them the legal right. So that's a private administrative process that they can just kidnap your children. Um, marriage licenses, public schools, okay, these are all contracts. Again, you're receiving benefits. You're entering your children into the public school system. You're getting a license by the state you know, to have marriage. These are all privileges and benefits. All these things here are privileges and benefits. So I want to drill home the point, and I'm not saying, you know, don't take privileges or benefits, but, you know, I asked you the question. If you want to be sovereign, if you want to be in control of your life more, why are you taking privileges and benefits? Okay, so be okay with people bitch slapping you around and taking away your privileges and benefits according to the terms that you agreed to and signed on to and the contracts that you entered into if you are going to take those privileges or benefits. That's just the bottom line. And I would uh, petition you to consider designing a life and designing a family um, or building families and communities and the world on a larger scale where people don't depend on state agencies and the government and Federal Reserve, central bank financing institutions uh, to give them permission to do things or to get lines of credit or to uh, have uh, business licenses and things like this. It starts with you and then you extend to your family, your friends, your community, your country and the world. It's a work in progress. It's easier said than done. But uh, I think the world would be a better place if people were not dependent upon, you know, Social Security to survive or unemployment to survive. So just something else to consider on a, on a, on a larger scale, helping to transform the way that people become independent. A lot of people on this webinar, you're probably interested in learning how to quote become sovereign but other people being sovereign has a, has a ricochet effect look at all the third world countries they're not sovereign and even the first world countries too the United States is not sovereign isn't 20% uh, of our debt owned by China and the rest by you know the Federal Reserve owners so in the third world, all these countries in Africa are in debt 
and the to the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund goes in and changes all their co country's policies and reduces the standard of living and takes away all the benefits that people get and reduces the value of the whole economy and everything like that because um, the countries entered into an agreement with the World Bank saying if you give us a loan we will let you change all our country's policies and it affects the people so this is happening all around the world where most of the countries and most of the people of the world are dependent upon the banks or dependent upon the governments and do we need to change that maybe maybe not just a question so kind of like moving on to where your intention is you've got your own problem you're probably on this webinar maybe because you have one of these problems but um, extend that out to the world the whole world is not sovereign people are People and countries and communities and countries are dependent on others and it makes them enslaved and it makes them have a lower quality standard of life. So if we could teach individuals and communities to become independent and sovereign and fend for themselves and not be dependent upon others, then people have the ability to have a higher quality of life I believe anyways on to the next slide the private administrative process is based on contract law there are I'm just gonna read these are quotes from uh, Brian Blum's books uh, uh, book on uh, contracts okay so <clears throat> he says that uh, or the textbook says that there are two situations in which silence binds the offeree even in the absence of intent to accept. So what does that mean? Uh, the easiest example here is the car repossession issue. Okay, so do you accept having your car repossessed because you didn't make your last two car payments? No. Obviously, you, you, you want to keep your car. Okay, but there are two situations in which silence, meaning they're trying to contact you, they're trying to collect a payment, they're trying to call you, they're sending you, hey, notice of late, notice you're late and now you're in default you know pay up pay up and your silence gives them the right to repossess the car and what's the difference like like this is so significant because if you were just to go and take someone else's car it would be grand theft auto if you were just to go and take someone else's children it would be kidnapping right if you were just to go and levy someone's bank account it would be some wire fraud financial crime something okay so going back on here all these examples um, the difference between it being Grand Theft Auto and a lawful repossession is all based on the contract it's all based on the paperwork and the records and the agreement between the parties and the consent of the other party so you may not intend to accept them repossessing your car or taking your children or taking their children back but there are two situations in which silence binds the offeree first silence operates as acceptance if the offerer the one making the offer proffers property or services with the offer and the offeree having a reasonable opportunity to return or refuse them exercises ownership rights over the property or accepts the benefit of the service you go into a restaurant you sit down you order food on the menu you eat and drink the food you had a reasonable opportunity to return or refuse the services of the sitting in the restaurant sitting in the chair ordering the food eating the food drinking the drink and you did not you had a reasonable opportunity to return or refuse the food you also exercised ownership rights over the property and or accepted the benefit of the service so when you go into a restaurant and order food you're agreeing to, to, to the contract that you are going to pay for the food before you leave. 
if you go into a restaurant and you eat all the food and you walk out and leave without paying for it, you broke the law and you can be arrested. <laughs> so contracts don't need to be in writing. That's a really clear example. But when, you know, when you're dealing with um, things like repossessing people's cars, you want to make sure you're not committing grand theft auto and you have some documentation that can back it up. And when you're the state and you don't want to be accused of kidnapping, you want to have a birth certificate and some other documents in place and a complaint and an affidavit and so forth in place to show that you uh, confiscated the children lawfully. Okay, same thing. IRS wants to make sure they have ample paperwork to document that the levying of the funds from your bank account was done lawfully. <clears throat> um, and so again, your silence operates as acceptance when there's a duty uh, let's go to the next one. When there's a duty to speak or respond, silence or inaction can be deemed as acceptance. Only in those narrow circumstances where there's a duty to speak or respond. So what they're saying is generally you can't get a contract by silence. But in the narrow circumstances where there is a duty to speak or respond, you can. You can. Silence or inaction can be deemed as acceptance. And then in the in the orange text example above, it's a different scenario. When when the offer proffers property or services with the offer and the offeree having a reasonable opportunity to return or refuse them, exercises ownership rights over the property or accepts the benefit of the service. And the other instance is in when you have a duty to speak or respond, Silence or inaction can be deemed as acceptance. So these are ways that we can move or change the contracts that we are involved with. And contracts can always change. You sit down at the restaurant, you order a bunch of food, they're gonna they're about to give you a bill, and you say, No, 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 no let me have one more margarita. Let me have one more martini. You just changed the contract. You ordered more food, now they're gonna give you a different bill. See? Uh, what's another example? You get married, and then you guys decide you want to split up, and you file a divorce. Now, wh which contract is the one in effect? Obviously, it's the one that happened afterwards, the divorce. Now, what would happen if you get married, divorced, remarried, divorced, remarried? Which is the contract that is the one that has the legal effect the last one whatever was done last okay so you can change your contract at any time and and it, and it can move under certain terms and conditions and 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 you know this can be a finesse in and of itself if you're trying to change the terms of the mortgage or whatever i mean you can always go back and rescind you can rescind a marriage license you can rescind a mortgage you can rescind a, a whole bunch of things and that's one angle that you can go. Um, it can be more challenging. There's a variety of different strategies that uh, that can be done to change some of the contracts that uh, you do not want to be involved with anymore. <coughs> so <coughs> maybe write down your questions about that and 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 uh, bring those questions up at a, at another time uh, to us. So let's see, in the, in the green text, it says, silence may operate as acceptance if prior dealings between the parties or other circumstances make it reasonable for the offerer to expect the offeree to give notice of rejection. In the absence of a specification in the offer, the acceptance takes effect as soon as it is put out of the offeree's possession. possession. So look at that, in the absence of specification in the offer. So what it's saying is, if there is a specific clause or term in the contract, in the trust or in the contract, then that is the law that governs the interaction. That is the law of the contract. If it's left out of the contract and something is ambiguous, then acceptance of the terms of the contract take effect as soon as it's put out of the offeree's possession. Okay. 
Let me give an example here with, uh, okay, silence may operate as acceptance of prior dealings between the parties or other circumstances make it reasonable for the offerer, offerer to expect the offeree give notice of rejection. What might be other circumstances? What might be other circumstances? Let's say that there's a vacant, uh, a, a, an abandoned home in your community and you send a notice of intent to mow the lawn and uh, build a fence around the swimming pool that has no fence around it um, and uh, do you know fix fix some other things around the house because it's a danger to the community I mean you got an open swimming pool here you know kids or dogs or animals can just uh, you know someone someone can be walking around on the property and fall into the pool and drown and kill themselves so hey I'd like to go on your property with your permission and build a fence around the swimming pool okay we'll build a new fence around the swimming pool because the old one is all dilapidated and might fall apart at any time and I'm gonna mow the lawn because there's gonna be fleas and there's gonna be bugs and it's it's lowering the property values because you know you didn't you know the the, the house is falling apart I want to paint the side of the house because it's lowering the property values and you send a notice of intent to do that and you have proof that the mail was delivered and they do not respond and then you go there and do that work and then send an invoice for them to pay you for the work and in that in that contract with the invoice it says hey if you don't pay me in 90 days and you go into default I can foreclose on your home that's a non-judicial foreclosure the IRS does it the banks do it in deed of trust states non-judicial states and you can do it too so the goal of this is to level the playing field and to teach people how to use contract law and rights that corporations and tax agencies and governments have been doing to you all along and been doing to the people their whole life it's a level playing field you just don't know how to enforce a private administrative process or how to create one and that's the point of this webinar so that was just one example uh, let's read this here learning more about the contract that needs to be in place in the private administrative process if acceptance by mail is permissible acceptance occurs as soon as the offering deposits a properly stamped and addressed acceptance in the mailbox if acceptance by mail is permissible well how is acceptance by mail okay obviously making your car payment <clears throat> paying your mortgage you you know acceptance by mail is permissible you can make your monthly payments write a check put in an envelope put a stamp on it and send it off in the mail okay the burden is on the offeree to prove proper dispatch so the offeree should make a good record of the mailing to avoid evidentiary problems the offeree must also ensure that the letter is correctly addressed stamped and otherwise properly prepared for delivery provided that the acceptance was properly mailed before lapse of the offer it does not matter that it was received after the offer terminated or was never received at all so basically what that means is if you if your monthly car payment is due on the first of the month and you put it put the check in the mail on the first of the month and put a stamp on it and put in the outgoing mail you made your car payment on time the company cannot charge you a late fee because they got the check three days later the date that you put it in the mail is the legal date it's called the mailbox rule if you see the bottom here in the green jump down to the green text the quote mailbox rule applies only to acceptances so are they accepting your payment for the month of June or whatever there you go so the mailbox rule putting it in the mail on the date is the legal date um, technically they can't charge you a late fee they will do that anyway because you don't know the law and you don't challenge it but you know I mean I've sent many of my payments in you know the date it was due I dropped it in the mail and they weren't able to charge a late fee because I spoke with them on the phone and I explained to them the mailbox rule <clears throat> talk to the supervisor if you know more about the law than they know um, 
<laughs> well, if you sound like it, they're likely to drop the late fee. <clears throat> um, a rejection or counteroffer sent by the offeree and a revocation sent by the offerer is effective only on receipt. So the date that that goes into effect is the day that it was delivered to them. Um, okay, so mailbox rule applies only to acceptances. So if you look at what I underlined up there in the yellow, the burden is on the offer to prove proper dispatch. So when you're dealing with situations like this, like I said, it's a very fine line between picking up your kids from school or being accused of kidnapping someone else's kids. It's a very fine line between grand theft auto and a lawful repossession of your car. So you want to create paperwork and records and, you know, authenticated self-authenticating evidence. Certified mail receipts, registered mail receipts, proof of delivery, affidavits of service and affidavits of non-response, like and copies the, the every document that you sign should be copied and should be copied in some instances you may, you may want them to be copied by a third party custodian of records not so that you make your own photocopies of what you say you mailed so the big difference is and yeah this is telling you in, in the yellow font on this page this is telling you you want to have proof that it was properly addressed stamped otherwise prepared for delivery you know um, to have a good record to avoid evidentiary problems okay Meaning if somebody brings it up later and says, well, no, you stole my car. You want to have proof that they entered into agreement that gave you the right to repossess their car if they didn't make the payments. Okay? So you want to have that contract and then this, the time that you sent the notices of default, if you're a finance company, right? You want to have all those records. You don't just want to have, oh, I have a certified mail receipt. You want to have proof that it was mailed, but also proof of what was put into the envelope that was mailed. The signed copies, the notarized copies, okay? So I see people that have copies of things that they mailed on their computer, they print it out, they sign it, and they never make a copy of it after they sign it and notarize it. You always got to make a copy of it after you sign it and notarize it, and then mail it, have your tracking number, have your copies, have your mail receipts and things back. And if this is all being done through a custodian of records that keeps these kinds of records in their normal course of business dealings, now you've got self-authenticating evidence according to the federal and state rules of evidence that is beyond a reasonable doubt the ball's in your court you've got all your all your evidence together that supports you so you've got everything in place to prove it's kind of like saying like well i have a witness on standby if someone says, I don't have a contract, I don't have the right to levy this person's bank account, repossess this person's car, pick up this kid, you know, like whatever, you, you want to have paperwork in place. But you want to have someone else who also looked at the paperwork and mailed it for you that will go to court and testify for you if it ever comes into question. Yes, I have copies of these on my file, in, in my file drawer, in my place of business. I brought them with me. Here's the paperwork that I was you know asked to make copies of put in an envelope seal bring it to the post office and mail and here you go and now you bring that into a courtroom okay that never has to happen if you do it properly if you have a custodian of records and you have your affidavits of service non-response and your mail receipts I've never seen that really have to happen but you want to have a witness on standby that would at least in theory go to court and testify. Now here's the thing is you don't have to have them go to court and testify if you haven't signed an affidavit that's in accordance with the rules of evidence of um, self-authenticating where the witness does not have to testify. So there's certain rules where the evidence is just as strong with an affidavit where the witness does not have to go out of their way, took off from work, fly to whatever city you're in and come to court and testify and have to deal with all that because it's kind of a hassle. So there are rules in the federal rules of evidence that talk about um, how you can submit evidence where nobody has to go to court and the court will accept that evidence on its face as the truth and as the facts okay and we'll get into that a little later okay provided that the acceptance was properly mailed before lapse of the offer it does not matter that it was received after the offer terminated or was never received at all wow pretty interesting huh 
provided that the acceptance was properly mailed before the lapse of the offer, does not matter that it was received after the offer was terminated or was never received at all. The law allocates the risk of uncertainty and of lost or delayed mail to the offerer. This is often referred to as the, as the mailbox or deposited acceptance rule. It is not confined to communication through the post office and applies whenever a non-instantaneous medium of communication is used. Okay, on to the next slide. Okay, so that record that I was talking about, the paperwork of your private administrative process, um, the record is your claim. Okay, so your claim is what gives you the right to uh, have standing in any public court action, uh, give you the right to enforce any rights through your private administrative process. Your claim is everything. Okay, so your paperwork with your contract offer that you sent to the other party and their, the proof of mailing and the proof of service and the maybe the, an affidavit of non-response if they didn't respond and all the associated paperwork, we're calling that the record, the private administrative record. That whole record is your claim. It allows you to negotiate and settle. Um, now you may have a claim of a zero balance based on creating some contract, uh, let's say with a credit card debt, and you send an offer and say, hey listen, prove to me that, prove to me, give, please provide proof of this debt, right? Or like with, you know, with a mortgage. Please provide the original note. Please show me proof that your bank loaned me money. You know, these are some angles that people, people go at. Um, sometimes people draft up a new promissory note and send it to the bank and say, I know that you guys monetize and securitize promissory notes, so here's another promissory note for half a million dollars. Here you go. And you send it to them with a contract, and you say, okay, if you keep this promissory note, you agree that the balance in the account is zero. Otherwise, return it to me. And they keep it, and they don't return it to you. Okay? So... Um, they, they keep it, they monetize it, they make money off of it, great. So now your claim is that the balance is zero. I paid off the mortgage with another promissory note, which the bank was able to monetize and finance and add to their ledger and, you know, the whole thing. So those are some different angles that some people in this area of contract law study do, in case you're new to this, to try to... Um, uh, discharge their their obligations to certain banks and financial institutions so um, your claim is of a zero balance however the banks probably gonna fight you over it and they're probably gonna continue sending you collection letters and in some cases they might open up a lawsuit or foreclosure suit or whatever against you you know regardless of what you claim okay the banks don't want people to just you know, discharge their obligations that easily, okay? So, <clears throat> your claim allows you to negotiate and settle with them and communicate with them and say, hey, listen, technically I have a claim here of a zero balance. I sent you guys a payment. You guys kept it, yada, yada, yada. You guys had an opportunity to respond and you didn't. So really, I don't owe you anything anymore, but let's negotiate and settle. What if you agree to reduce, what if I agree to sign a uh, modification agreement where you cut down the principal on my mortgage by 50% and cut down the interest by 50%? I would agree to sign that. Even though I really don't owe you anything anymore, I'll agree to, I'll agree to that. And you must dismiss this, you know, we must agree to dismiss this court case. So that might be an angle if you're not that confident and you're getting like some action, you might, you might, like a lot of people are very adamant about being right and about like, well, oh, I don't owe the bank anything anymore and blah, 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 blah. And if you're good at contract law, you can win. And I have no problem in you going like that and, and, and winning. And we help people to win those situations where they don't pay the credit card company anything, they don't owe anything, they don't get anything. 
okay? Mortgages, you know, zeroed and the bank doesn't come back and it's, it's, a, set, it's, it's a set thing, but some, some battles are larger to fight than others, and especially with the real estate and the mortgages. So um, even doing a private administrative process to allow you to negotiate with the bank is another opportunity to strongly consider depending on how how much you want to fight them it's kind of like think about it like you have an insurance claim you got you know you got into an accident and it's the other person's fault your insurance company and their insurance company communicate and you know you know you've got a, a claim for three thousand dollars in damages to your car and the insurance company is negotiating that with the other company and they come to an agreement that they can both sign on to and acknowledge okay because in this process your claim is done through non-response so um, unless you know a lot about enforcement and about the law um, you might want to be open in certain search situations to negotiating or maybe not the next bullet point keep you keep your private record to assert your claim okay of a zero balance or of that you have the highest claim over your children and nobody else can possess and take you know your children um, you've got uh, a claim for what other examples I don't know a claim that there's no more taxes owed whatever the case may be so we need to keep your record to assert your claim um, in case again the case is ever brought up into question um, and how you enforce your claim or how you would assert your claim in court if there are, is any public action if you opened up a lawsuit or they opened up a lawsuit regarding this matter the the entire private record uh, could be and could or should be sent to the judge in chambers marked private and confidential because it's a private record and you can also take certain actions to become the priority security interest holder in any court case and you have to do certain things in order to really be the priority security interest holder in any court case and then you would give the court notice that you are you might file it on a use the notice of that on a UCC one and let the court know and let the other party know hey I'm the priority security interest holder in this court case so any proceeds that are collected collected you know from this case have to be paid to me so that's what that means um, and then again you would conditionally accept the proceedings um, why you know if, if they want to proceed with the case it's going to be under certain terms and conditions that my claim is the fact and the truth no balances due on this account and I'm the priority security interest holder in this court case Boom. Um, another thing to do with your record is file an abstract that the county recorder or miscellaneous case index file or on a UCC1 non-UCC filing notice and at the International Commercial or and or at the International Commercial Registry. This is creating a public record. So this is like um, in a non-judicial state how they file a notice of default at the county recorder. Um, or think of another example. Yeah, before they sell your home in California in a non judicial foreclosure state they file a notice of default at the county recorder just that there is some public record of the private process so when you do a private process you might want to put an abstract of your notice of default um, in one of those case in one of those places county recorder miscellaneous case file federal or state court UCC one International Commercial Registry. Those are four examples of where you can do that. And your private administrative record can be sent to credit reporting agencies to remove negative items. And in the in the in the removing of negative items from a credit report, usually the credit reporting agency is going to want to see one of those things the filing at the county recorder the miscellaneous case file a UCC one filing or something filed um, probably those are the the best three you might want to do more than one of them and then just just bring that to the credit report 
open up a dispute with the credit reporting agencies and give them that public record because they're going to look at the public record. They're going to look at that notice of the public record um, is going to move the credit reporting agencies um, to remove the items, not the private record. All right, memorandum of law in support of the private administrative process. He who does not deny admits that's a maxim of law. And so that's just going back to the silence is acceptance principle. Look up that maxim on Google. And then the other big one here is Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 of the Constitution of the U.S. Constitution. No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation. Grant letters of marquee and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts, pass any bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts or grant any title of ability. So basically it says the state shall not enter into any treaty alliance or confederation that impairs the obligation of contracts. So you have a right to contract. Your private administrative process is based on contract and by you enforcing the rights and doing that, it's based on your un unalienable right to contract. You have a right to contract. Federal Civil Rules of Procedure, we kind of went over this before. Um, is there any record in opposition to the record? So um, you're sending your, if you're sending your private administrative record in chambers to the judge, um, you know, your position is there, is there any record in opposition to the record before the court? Your record is in indisputable, it hasn't been rebutted, so on and so forth. So your record is the fact and the truth. It's been submitted. They have, have are they going to say that, oh, we did respond? If you have an affidavit or non response, you have an affidavit or non response. Public side. Exhibit in filing case interrogatories. Okay, so I mean, how this might play out in a very, very, very small portion of cases is, um, you know, if you get a foreclosure, if you did a private administrative record and asserting your claim that the mortgage balance is zero, now they opened up a foreclosure case and you're putting in your answer saying, you know, no, 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 no. You're rebutting all their presumptions in their complaint and you're including the private administrative record in uh, chambers to the judge on the private side. Now on the public side, just jump down to the red and the green bullet points, private side, record and chambers to the judge, green petition for mandatory judicial notice. So on the public side, you want to do a filing of a petition for mandatory judicial notice for the court to take mandatory judicial notice of the private record submitted in camera to the judge via registered mail number so-and-so. And it's not filed into the case and nobody can see your private records, um, but it's part of the case. And the court must rule with the private record in mind. Now on the public side as well, if you're doing discovery and things like that, you can do a interrogatories for the bank's CFO chief financial officer or whoever you mailed the um, promissory note or the offer or whatever the affidavits to and say hey did you or did you not get this mail did you or did you not what did you do with this promissory note did you monetize it did you sell it did you add it to your books what did you do with the paperwork that was sent to you did you or did you not get this contract notice of settlement offer did you or did you not get request regarding statement of account did you or did you not get this and again, all the paperwork that we discussed regarding the private process being, you know, having a custodian of records that keeps uh, records in their normal course of business and all those things um, has to do with Rule 803 and Rule 902 of the Federal Rules of Evidence. So go look that up on Google or go look that up in the Federal Rules of Evidence and you will learn how to orchestrate and prepare your private administrative process so that you have admissible records to evidence in court where the court, according to the court's own rules, 
they're going to say, ah, oh, well, we have to acknowledge this as evidence. We have to acknowledge this as evidence. And then your claim, if you assert your claim, you should win if it winds up going to court. But the whole point in this whole process is, is to avoid court whenever possible. But if you're dealing with mortgages and things like that, they're going to wind up in court. If you're dealing with credit cards and things like that, only a small portion of them are going to wind up trying to open up a lawsuit. And uh, most likely you, you, you never have to you know, wind up going to court in order to get a victory. But if you look at the bottom here, it says in, the, in yellow, since the law is on your side, if you do all these things properly, to win in a court action, the PAP, private administrative process, can dissuade the other party from moving forward, initiating, or continuing an action, especially if it's for a low dollar amount. If it's for a credit card for only five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, are they going to want to open up a suit against you? Is a credit card for $1,000, are they going to want to open up a suit against you and waste their time, especially if they've seen that you're preparing your whole process, building up a record of evidence, using Rule 902, 803, and all these different things, that they're not going to be able to beat you. They're not going to be able to, to win. So in, in, in our experience, there are lots of cases that 90% of the time, they just dissuade the other party from moving forward. They just, they, or, they, or they don't move forward. And then there are other cases where, you know, when we're dealing with mortgages and foreclosures, um, they, they will probably move forward anyway. And so you really need to have your records and paperwork and everything together so that you can defeat any uh, foreclosure action. And then on top of that, you want to open, like the best thing to do is, to, is for you, when you're done with your process, for you to open up an action, for, for you to open up an action, sue the other company and say, hey, listen, I have a claim of a zero balance, but there's no satisfaction of mortgage that Bank of America was supposed to file. So I'm going to sue you to compel you to perform to file a satisfaction of mortgage and release the lien so that I have a clear title and so that I don't get any stupid foreclosure suits later on. And that is the more technical that is what probably the next uh, the next webinar will be on is actually um, how you and, and and when you open up a lawsuit it's like ten times easier to win okay they don't have their teeth into it they haven't prepared for it they haven't given the cost-benefit analysis and say yeah let's open up a foreclosure case against this guy we will probably win you opening up a lawsuit, it's the element of surprise they might look back and say, "Oh, well, we don't even have the original note anymore." Because remember, a lot of the prom a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the the original notes got destroyed in the World Trade Center when the World Trade Center collapsed. Um, you know, they've been securitized, they've been sold. Eighty percent of the time, they don't have the notes. So, when you go and sue them, if they know that they're going to lose and they can't bring a claim, if they can't bring a claim upon which relief can be granted, you have a very good possibility of winning by default if you're the one who is proactive and opens up a lawsuit and if you do it in a federal district court uh, the likelihood that you're gonna have to actually physically go and appear in court reduces you know dramatically so, so especially if they don't respond if they don't respond you never have to go to court you, you get a summary judgment automatically or you get a default judgment automatically okay so this stuff can really work for you. I try to put all this stuff in here and give you all the scenarios of, you know, uh, you know, all the laws that support you or whatever. Uh, I'm giving you background so that you know what you, you have the confidence behind you and understand the laws and understand the contract law that this is all based on. That's all that this is trying to do. So. Um, Shoot back up to the slides here. If you have a proper proper planning prevents poor performance, as one of my friends always says. But proper planning means high likelihood of victory. Okay, if you move forward quickly, or if you move forward swiftly. I don't want to say quickly, but you because you want to do everything properly and don't half-ass certain things. But uh, swiftly and effectively, and you've got boom. It's like 
fighting a war, basically. You know, if you invade a country and do it and be like, oh, we're gonna, we're just gonna uh, drop bombs over here, and then we're gonna wait 30 days and drop a bomb over here, and then we're gonna wait 90 days, and then maybe we're gonna do this. Like, if you're planning on winning, element of surprise. Boom, go in, drop all the bombs, invade, bring your troops in, land your planes, bring your tanks, bring your submarines, and boom, you just invaded a country. Okay, so that's kind of like the strategy of, of, of this. Not, not, not that I like the analogy of war, but it's, this is kind of like a paperwork war, <laughs> for lack of better uh, metaphor. Okay, so the private administrative process creates a contractual right to release a lien or levy, file a lien or levy, file a public notice, sell assets, transfer property, and others. I think we kind of touched on all those. I mean, that's really what you want, right? You want your liens and levies to be released on a mortgage, on uh, taxes, on different things like that, right? Transfer property. All right, so what are some successful uses of the private administrative process? against debt collectors, very, very effective, especially third-party debt collectors. They don't really have much standing at all, even in a public administrative process. If you don't do a private administrative process and you just do a lawsuit against debt collectors, I mean, it's one of the easiest, easiest, uh, or simplest, easier out of all these processes. It's the easiest. I'm not saying that it's easy, because, um, easy it's it's subjective how much experience do you have how much do you do you know but it's a it's it's consistently effective if done correctly in our experience credit card debt almost just about as easy whether it's a third party debt collector or the original creditor or they're they're still relatively effective to be done with a, not a tremendous amount of headache uh, private process. Sometimes there's a private process and a public process. And on some of the um, bullet points I went over uh, here, this is really your your strategy. You know, ballpark is to look at all these situations um, when you're when you're looking at strat. You know, strategy. Um, and I like mm, people not going to court at all. There's like I said, there's two, three different strategies. Dismiss it, you know, conditional acceptance, becoming the priority security interest holder in the case. There's lots of different things that can avoid court, but it's also very, very effective if you can go to court and speak and not be nervous. It's very, very effective to win in court if you have proper strategy, you do a little bit of role playing and so forth. Uh, judgments, either vacating judgments or uh, discharging or dismissing judgments, all tax matters, um, especially IRS tax matters getting off the tax grid overall, acquiring vacant homes we spoke about, court ca any court case, fixing credit report we spoke about, relatively simple, uh, divorce, custody, settlement issues. Um, so we never really touched on that other than the custody issue, but um, discharging your marriage license or doing a private administrative process leading up to a divorce can definitely be effective way of influencing the terms of the divorce, the custody, the alimony, the splitting up of the assets. Um, most courts are very biased and will screw over, well, they're very, they're, they're very, they're not really fair. Uh, the court system is not like fair down the middle. Okay, equal custody, three and a half days with you a week, three and a half days with you. Or the kid spends a week with you and then spends a week with you. The courts are very unfair in, I mean, I have guy friends that, I mean, they, they see their kids like, you know, twice a month. They see their kids like once, you know, two hours on the weekend and that's it. And that's not very fair. So if uh, same thing, like alimony is just ridiculous. So you married someone for a year and then they get half of your assets that you worked your whole life for. That's not very fair either that the courts just take all your money and give it to someone else. I mean, it's, 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 it makes me want to vomit sometimes. But uh, custody as well. So all these issues can be remedied with a private administrative pro or can be influenced or remedied with a private administrative process, um, which we have actually helped and have a, almost a, 
100% success on the several people that we've worked with on helping them get exactly what they wanted out of the case. And they never had to hire an attorney. Uh, several of the people we worked with, they never had to hire an attorney, and they got exactly what the, the court uh, basically acknowledged all the points in their private administrative process. Say they sent the process into judges' chambers or filed into the case or whatever. The judge gave them everything that they they created a, 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 a settlement offer to their ex-wife, uh, right, and uh, to to create an amicable terms of the divorce. <laughs> Actually, what the, what the this one agreement said: um, Here are the terms of us staying together. I have no problem with us living in the same house, loving each other, and raising the kid, and you know, letting our differences settle aside, and being in love again, and 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 being in a cooperation and harmony. But if you decide that you don't want that anymore, here are the terms of the divorce. And he, he put point A, point B, point C, point D, point E, point F. And the judge gave him every single point that he asked for. So, I mean, the, 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 he didn't have an attorney and he went to court. All he did was stand on his private administrative process through the divorce. And his, his ex-wife had an expensive attorney. And the attorney was like flawed. They were, they, they were like, they were, they, their jaw dropped on the floor when the judge issued this order. So... <laughs> private administrative process can work man <laughs> I've seen it work uh, so we do uh, you know there's a lot of divorce situations that um, people are asking us for help with foreclosure mortgage discharge I extremely caution you that you know if you look at the bottom in, in, in magenta it says buyer beware proceed at your own risk or you'll proceed with some risk and the mortgage and foreclosure issues are the most uh, stressful they're the most involved, there's the most amount of work, and it's the least amount of success. The people doing these things themselves have the least amount of success. People, I don't know what people think, that they can just experiment and do their own like process and think that they're going to be... I mean, I, all I'm saying is be okay with a 50% chance that you're not going to win, no matter how good you are. That's all. I'm not saying, oh, this, this never works for mortgages. I'm just saying people have unrealistic expectations. You got to understand, if your home is worth three hundred, five hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, the bank is going to fight you to the end. They're going to pay tens of thousands of dollars for attorneys to fight you till the end. Now, if you did a private administrative process and you were the one opening up the court action and you were the one initiating the action, you know, there's a way through element of surprise and the analogy of the battle and winning the war and, you know, coming in with your submarines and your planes and your tanks and you can just boom, 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 boom. There is a way to do that that is more successful. I would say somewhere in the range of, you know, 65, 70, 80 percent, you know, with less less ease, less paperwork, less, you know, dragging on for months and months and months and, and, and more than a year or so. So just, just as a disclaimer on the foreclosure mortgage issues. But if you have, you listen, if, you, if you've got no other options, what do you have to lose? Um, and, and this stuff is, the law is on your side. And people have won before and people are winning. So I'm not trying to dissuade you or, or, or sway you <laughs> one way or the other, but I'm just trying to give you the full full disclosure about how effective this stuff is, how much work it is, and how difficult it is. Okay? Student loans, um, student loans, again, element of surprise, I think, is important. Um, and doing a private process followed by a public registration is extremely important. Unlike the credit cards and debt collectors, you definitely want to put more resources into the student loans. Um, you definitely want to consider whether it's a federal loan or a private loan, and um, you know, you know, make sure that you incorporate an entirely comprehensive process for you know whatever you're, you know, going to do. Car loans. Um, the reality with the car loans is that if it's an old car, if it's like 2007 and beyond, generally they try to collect. They try to repossess it if they can't find it at the address that they think it's at, based on 
you know the application that you signed and they 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 have their repo guys do their rounds in your neighborhood and they still can't find it and months and months and months six months seven eight nine months go by and they can't find it they write it off okay so um they write it off so that's the worst case scenario now can you do a private administrative process and force the company to release the lien send you the title and uh you know send you a zero balance and all that yeah has it been done yeah but in the majority of cases they are again still going to try to collect still going to try to repossess okay especially if you don't have certain irs tax forms and if you're not very adamant about you know pushing them with certain enforcement like certain things that you should really know a lot about the forms before you you know you should know a lot about the irs forms before you fill them out um so anything in, in, in the car loans um if it's 2008 2009 10 11 if it's if it's after 2008 and if it's an expensive car um they're likely to try to get it back even if they can't find it and repossess it and that's been our experience so if you got a 2013 you know uh, brand new Lexus or whatever um, you do a private administrative process you, you should probably follow it up with you opening up a lawsuit before they open up a lawsuit because what they do with these expensive cars that are only a year or two or three old is they're going to open up a lawsuit and try to get an order from the court for you to overturn your car and if you don't do it you'll be in contempt of court and you could be arrested so you want to sue them before they sue you and you want to get your final judgment in court before they sue you and the element of surprise you open up a lawsuit against them they have 20 to 30 days to bring a counterclaim otherwise that's it they're just defending your lawsuit so i think the element of surprise goes a long way and getting these processes started sooner rather than later goes a long way in the um effectiveness and success um, let's see if you're current or behind yeah I mean those processes can be done if you're current or behind and the quicker that you move forward like if you're behind on your car payment by like six seven eight nine months and it's only and and, and, and they're likely to open up a lawsuit to try to get you to overturn the car um, you know it's not a great position to be in because you should have started your process if you're going to do this process you should have started it like the month that you couldn't make your payment that you decided that you were not going to make your payments anymore that month would have been the best month to start same thing with a mortgage if you can't afford your mortgage anymore and you absolutely can't and you're out of options and you're going to do a private administrative process and or or you believe in it or you understand it or you've been studying a while and your heart is set on doing a private administrative process and you want to do it okay do the process the month after you stopped making payments because that's how you go forward with them with the element of surprise when you got your your case sitting around in their file oh this guy hasn't paid their mortgage in a year or two they're already trying to open up and build a case against you to open up a lawsuit so that's it can still be done and sometimes people live in their houses for two three four five six years depending on what state county you're in without any foreclosure case or anything coming so um find out the specifics you know find out the specifics about what happens in this state and what's my likelihood of you know um and again there's no guarantee there's no likelihood of success especially if you're doing this yourself um again it can be done if you're current or behind buyer beware proceed at your own risk i kind of went over the um pros and cons of all these different kinds of cases there i'm sure that there are many other kinds of cases that i'm not covering but these are like the key ones that people inquire about see getting towards the end um, okay we went over that one already okay when it doesn't work when does a private administrative process not work when there's a fiduciary duty to perform that is still obligated that would be uh, what's a good example for that if you haven't discharged okay when there's a surety that was pledged that is still obligated, when a debt or claim has not been satisfied, or when the other party is too much to lose and wants to battle you until the end. 
pick your battles. Okay, so the last one is the easiest to explain. We kind of already discussed that with the mortgages and the real estate. And if it's an expensive car, they're going to want to battle you out and, and, and until until the end, uh, until some final court action happens. Um, the other examples, let's see. Okay, when there's a surety. So if you, if you have a birth certificate and you haven't discharged it or you haven't accepted it for value or done anything to it, if you've got a criminal matter and you're still in their record system, the surety or the collateral for the birth, for the, um, uh, the charges, meaning if the, if the charges are not resolved or dismissed or discharged, you're the one going sitting in a prison cell um, to, you know, to pay your debt to society, okay? If you're still the surety, then this process is going to have a hard time making this work. So you're going to need to accept for value and discharge and become a secure party creditor or become a sovereign or do one of those other processes to gain your separation of your legal fiction from you as the private living individual. That's what I mean by you still being the surety. Okay? When there's still fiduciary duty to perform, uh, let's see. Uh, when there's still a debt or claim that has not been satisfied. Um, yeah, so a lot of people say, uh, I mean, listen, there's a lot of contracts. People took out the mortgage. You made payments for several months, several years, whatever, and the bank is going to show you all the statements and all the payments that were made. Same thing with a credit card. They're going to try to show you all the statements and all the things that were made, and it, the process works. It puts you in a better position when you have discharged or attempting to discharge like if you're accepting for value or sending a promissory note or a bond or whatever to set off and satisfy the 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 dis the uh, the debt then you have better standing um you have you have bet you have better standing at least that's one position on it there are still people that are winning arguing the bank never loaned me money i mean you can pick and choose whatever way you whatever way you want um but some cases, in some instances, it's going to be more difficult if you go that route. When there's a fiduciary duty to perform, they're still obligated. Um, what can I say about that? Um, oh, paying child support. You know, so if you're if you you're still in the system, your children are still in the system, and there's a there's a court order. See, th there you go. When there's a court order ordering you to make payments, this. It's gonna you're gonna need to use a lot more finesse to discharge that court order and all the other adhesion all the other contracts that tie you all the ties that bind you <laughs> so to speak so these are some issues maybe this slide shouldn't be called when it doesn't work but things that make it you know other things to consider maybe it should maybe you should say things to consider that you might have a little more difficulty okay throwing this in there possibilities I'm not involved with any of these things. These are just some ideas that I'm throwing out there. And definitely make sure that you have a lot of experience with this before you even think about doing anything with this. But changing corporations' policies. So what's to say you can't create a private administrative process and use silence as acceptance to change some big corporations' policies? What, what if you were to make a purchase of stock for some corporation, you know, Exxon Mobil, Monsanto, big drug company, you know, pharmaceutical companies, whatever. And if you were to enter into a contract with them through the mail, through silence, through acceptance, through whatever, through giving them, you know, giving them a certificate, giving them an agreement that you signed to buy stock in the company, and putting terms and conditions on there, saying, "Okay, I'll buy stock in your company, or I'll send you, um, I'll." I'll I'll add you as a beneficial interest holder of my trust and give you dividends, monthly dividends of the trust's um, capital interest, let's say, meaning you're giving out dividends of the trust's like stock and you're paying Monsanto every month and by them accepting your payments. And, hold, and, and, and accepting the checks that you send them or the money orders that you send them, they agree to phase out all genetically modified organisms within the next three years. Or alternatively, agree to a court order to revoke their company charter and put them completely out of business. 
You know what I'm saying? So, like, there's some larger possibilities here to changing the world rather than your own particular, like, you know, $3,000 tax debt or, you know, you got this, you know, child support debt that's more expensive and all these complaints that we get people calling us, like, if you learn private administrative processes, there's a lot of things that you can do with it to, um, and that's an experiment. I don't know anyone who's actually tried to, like, force a company to, um, you know, change their, uh, you know, what they were doing by doing a private administrative process, but I could see it work. I, I don't see any reason why, uh, at least according to the law, it wouldn't work. Now, they probably would fight you over it, but um, just an idea. There's a lot of possibilities. You know, people are talking, like, there's so many people that contact us, and they're like, oh, my mortgage, my foreclosure, blah, 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 and it's less work to claim an abandoned house. It's less work to do the vacant home acquisition process than to spend the next two years fighting to save your your the house that you you know the for, that's being foreclosed right now so all i'm trying to say is like pick your battles and look at with an open mind okay and um next bullet point easy example creating contracts to cease fluoridation of water um okay so the same thing why not send certificates of benef uh, of capital interest or promissory note or whatever to the county or the state or whatever and say hey by you keeping this you agree to cease all fluoridation of the water or alternatively pay every homeowner you know a hundred thousand dollars a year so that they can buy expensive uh, you know uh, distilling machines that take the fluoride out of our water you know something like that you know what I'm saying I would make the terms reasonable you know, I would make, I, you don't want to, you don't want to, for, I, just so many people contact us and they're like, oh, I want to go after this guy for $10 million and $100 million and $100 billion. Not going to work. You're not going to get any court to enforce that and, 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 and allow that. That's, you got to be reasonable with what you're doing here. Okay. Be humble, be reasonable. And when it works out, you're going to be glad you didn't try to, you know, quote, go after somebody for $100 million. Uh, and then my other little bullet point is here is, you know, if you're concerned about fluoridation of the water or anything like that, why not secede your land and get your own water and, you know, collect the rainwater and then distill the rainwater? I mean, that's just my own, like, why depend on the water coming through the pipes from the county and the town? Why not take yourself, claim the land patent, take yourself off the property uh, tax map and be completely seceded and then the powers that be, so, so to speak, I don't, I don't want to call them the powers that be, but three-lettered three uh, pri private corporation agencies that walk around with, you know, badges and doing different things are not allowed to step foot on your land if you've got the land patent. Lawfully, they're not allowed on your land. The only reason that CPS, Child Protection Services, etc., are allowed on your land or even um, Internal Revenue Service knocking on your front door, right? The reason why they're all allowed on your land is because, or the police investigating, you know, oh, we have a domestic violence phone call, blah, blah, blah. The reason why they can come up, knock on your door, do whatever they do, even even search warrants, knocking in your door, all that stuff, searching for drugs, the reason they can do that is because they have the legal title. It's a contract. It's, it's, it's private administrative process can be done to discharge all that as well. That's another possibility I didn't put on the slide. Easy example, create an agreement. Okay, so this is just another example. I already talked about creating an agreement with, for example, Monsanto to get them to agree to stop producing GMOs or terminate their patents or seeds or alternatively revoke the company charter. Just an idea. Could do the same thing with oil companies. Um, reducing the public debt possibility. So when you do private, when you do private, uh, in some instances, some of these processes have the effect of reducing the public debt. That's the tax issues and things like that. We need to reduce the public debt. We need to reduce the United States' debt. So that's a good thing. Stopping forced vaccines and chemotherapy. I think I talked about that with controlling, you know, being the priority security interest holder over your own children prevents anybody from forcing to do anything against your will to your children. You're the priority security interest holder. Uh, going through a probate of the John H. Doe estate, uh, private probate process, uh, claiming the executorship over your estate. Not going to go into that now. 
canceling contracts that bind you, pulling out of the system entirely. Okay, those are some other possibilities. And that's the end of the slideshow. So thank you for watching. I tried to go over as much detail as possible. Okay, an hour and 25 minutes. I tried to make it 20 or 30 minutes, but I just can't. There's just so much to talk about, and I really want to be comprehensive with 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 these with these things. So, uh, thank you for watching. I hope that was a comprehensive overview of the private ministry process. I know we didn't get the time to actually pull up any documents, um, but there 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 will be another video where we pull up documents, um, or on a consult, you can have um, you know some you can you can pull up some documents and and actually see some of the documents that are used or so forth. So. Anyways, thanks for watching.